Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Today, we're going to be talking about Star Wars Rogue One. Except that's not the title. I've already got it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Thank you. I think there's going to be a lot of that kind of corrections going on. We're going to be joined today by a special guest. And before I introduce him, though, right off the top, there are going to be spoilers in this. In fact, the entire discussion is essentially going to be spoilers for Rogue One. If you haven't seen it and want to, please do not listen any further. If you haven't seen it and don't care about spoilers, that's fine. I think we'll probably explain it well enough that you'll be able to get something from this if you wish to. All right, with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our guest. So Samuel McLean is someone we have just spoken with for the first time (laughs) about 10 minutes ago, whom we know from Twitter. And Sam is a PhD student at King's London, technically still a PhD student, but very, very close to no longer being one. In the Department of War Studies, he researches naval history after the Restoration. He is also social media editor at BritishNavalHistory.com and dabbles in podcasting. And we're very happy to welcome you to our podcast. Hi, Sam. Hi. Hello. Greetings. Hi. Salutations. (laughs) (laughs) So thanks so much for coming and talking about this. I was really pleased when you suggested it because you actually brought it up because we felt sort of that we needed to talk about Rogue One, having done The Force Awakens back in episode nine. But I honestly, I think we were both at a little bit of a loss initially exactly what we wanted to say about it. It's one of these things where there's sort of a lot of things that we want to talk about, uh, but it's hard to figure out where to start. Mm -hmm. And exactly how to thematically, somehow with Force Awakens, there was an immediate sort of thing I wanted to say about it and things we wanted to say. And uh, this was a little more diffuse, but I think even just in chatting about it beforehand, we found some things to talk about. So that's great. Well, I, I saw it at 1030 in the morning in a little, a tiny little 80 seat theater in Rangiora in New Zealand, uh, <laughs> which is 18 hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time. Right. So when I came, I, I mean, I, I came out of the theater, I got back to where I was staying and I, I said on Twitter, I want to talk about it since I was 18 hours ahead of everybody else. It was really hard to because nobody else had seen it, <laughs> and I refused to spoil anything for anybody. Right, <laughs> but by the time everybody else had seen it, I wasn't sure. It was like you know, with, with the Gilmore Girls and the and their four episodes. I just mm-hmm. I wasn't sure where to start and wh- what to talk about. So hopefully this maybe a little bit of a therapeutic effect for you to finally get out what you wanted to talk <laughs> about for some. I think so. <laughs> All right. Certainly be cathartic. Yes, exactly. Okay, just before we get to that, the last thing I wanted to say is the other way that you and we are connected is through being members of the new fledgling, shall I call it, uh, Humanities Podcasters group or network, which we've been putting together. And so I think we'll just pause briefly here to play a promo from another member of the group who has very kindly put one together for Humanities Podcasts to give you an idea of other kinds of podcasts that are out there that the audience who listens to this may wish to hear. If you like this podcast, you might be interested in other podcasts that focus on the humanities. In fact, if you search Twitter for the hashtag Humanities Podcasts, you'll find plenty of shows on history, language, literature, philosophy, art, and more. These are podcasts by people who enjoy telling stories, exploring the arts in our world, and who want to share their knowledge. Some examples of podcasts you'll find are Go Dig a Hole, an archaeology podcast, the Trojan War podcast, which retells the classic myth, and As We Like It, where three friends talk about film adaptions of Shakespeare. Search the hashtag Humanities Podcast today, or follow Humanities Podcasters on Twitter. And if you're a humanities podcaster, use the hashtag in your tweets so others can find you. And finally, one last thing before we really get into the meat of it, which is, I'm pretty sure we're all having something to drink tonight, aren't we? Yes, we are. (laughs) So what are you drinking tonight, Sam? 
Uh, I am drinking my version of a Negroni, oh. which is actually it's kind of a, a Boulevardier because uh, I'm using rye mm -hmm. and I'm using I think I used red vermouth mm -hmm. and I, I'm in, I have no Campari, but I do have some uh, vodka that I infuse with rhubarb. Oh. And so I'm using that instead. And it also is bitters. Right. So it's one to one to one mm -hmm. plus some bitters on top of that. And is it good? It is delightful. <laughs> oh, excellent. That sounds interesting. Yeah, that sounds really good, actually. I mean, the rhubarb would be a nice kind of bitterness and sweetness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're having <laughs> is a little more, well, it's sort of conceptually, we, we try to have things that are related to what we're talking about. But I was kind of at a loss, so what we ended up with... No, not blue milk this time? Not blue <laughs> no, milk. Not blue milk, no. <laughs> and not blue and red lightsaber-colored drinks. Um, thanks to 12Tone on Twitter, who suggested this, who um, does videos on music theory, if you're interested in that, on YouTube, who mentioned that, of course, it has to have gin in it, if I'm doing a Rogue One cocktail. Yes. And I cannot believe that, that hadn't even occurred to me. <laughs> and spelling apparently rules all for me. So what we are making, what I made for us was aviation cocktails, which is gin and a little bit of Luxardo maraschino liqueur and a little bit of creme de violette and lemon juice. And I thought that they're gin cocktails and they're aviation, that sort of pilot. Right. Absolutely. Kind of. And then the gin is a death's door gin. And after all, they all die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Major spoiler. <laughs> I told you there was a spoiler in our drinks. Are you both drinking the same thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah tonight. And how is it? It's good. Yeah, it's a very flowery, kind of almost perfumey drink. The combination of the maraschino liqueur and the creme de violette is very flowery. Mm -hmm. But it's got enough lemon juice in it to mm -hmm. ground it, I think. Yeah, it's quite nice. Okay, now we can turn to the movie. <laughs> so, what was it you wanted to start with, Sam? The thing I wanted to start with was the opening crawl from A New Hope. It is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships, striking from a hidden base, have won their first victory against the evil Galactic Empire. During the battle, Rebel spies have managed to steal secret plans to the Emperor's ultimate weapon, the Death Star an armored space station with enough power to destroy an, another, an entire planet. And that pretty much sums up the movie. Yes. Yeah. It's the plot summary for the yeah. movie. And I, I think that's both a really good place for starting to talk about the movie, but it's also, I think, the place where a lot of people have issues with the movie. It's because I've, I've seen a lot of commentary when people say, well, it's, it's, it's not original. We, you know, we know where this story is going. Uh, yeah. Right. And I just one of one of the recurring problems that there's going to be for mm -hmm. every time they make a new Star Wars movie is you have the Star Wars fans who want a star a story in the Star Wars universe, but you also mm -hmm. want people who want something completely original. Mm -hmm. It's conceptions of originality. We go back to what we talked about with Force Awakens and what me what originality means and what what and creativity what counts as creativity and what doesn't count as creativity and there this idea that originality is the keystone for creativity people are going to have different opinions on that but if that is your key marker you're not going to really like anything from star wars i'm not quite sure why anybody thinks there's going to be any originality in that way of course they're they're often working within constraints with a lot of the other you know sort of sideline projects mm -hmm. like the tv shows mm -hmm. they can't write storylines that directly contradict anything mm -hmm. that's been established in the movies mm -hmm. they've got these very rigid parameters of this character has to survive or that character has to die or these events have to occur in this order and then they write the stories in the in interstice interstices interstices in the gaps between them yes <laughs> did either of you ever read the expanded universe novels for star wars no I there's uh, I, I'm going to rough say there's about 40 novels, probably, mm -hmm. for Star Wars, uh, starting in the, in the 80s. And some of these mm – -hmm. so when Disney bought Star Wars, all of those novels, which had been considered to be canon – Yeah. Yeah. Have been decanonized. Had been decanonized. Yeah. I don't know if that's a word, but I think it should be. They've been defrocked. Their saintliness <laughs> has been removed from them. 
Um, yeah, yeah, in fact, we were just discussing that with our son tonight, the 10 year old, because we've been watching Rebels, yes. the animated series. Which and, is canon, if I Which is canon. indeed yeah. canon. And and our son said, Oh, I think I think Thrawn is going to survive because in one of the expanded universe novels, I think he knows this from a YouTube video, uh, he does X or Y. And I said and Mark said, Oh, they're not canon anymore. Except there are now novels that were published since then. That are canon. That are right. canon. So yes, I don't know which including, one this involves. Including into. the novel Thrawn. Oh, so that which is I probably don't really the one know that, much about, but that he might there was a lot about. of brilliant stuff in those novels. I mean, mm -hmm. really good writing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also a lot of terrible things. Yeah, including all like all the new Jedi. Just there was a whole bunch of stuff that really should have been gotten rid of because it was bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they've done is they've created by making it all not canon. They they're not saying this can't exist. Mm -hmm. They're just allowing themselves to cherry pick from that. Yeah. yeah. Dramatic. The dramatis persona and mm -hmm. uh, from characters and events, they can cherry pick whatever they want. I mean, it's not quite writing fan fiction, but they can they can take those established ideas and characters and do whatever they want with them. And there's mm -hmm. so much potential there for story, for really good storytelling. Mm -hmm. Especially if you can, as an audience, not concern yourself with that concept of mm. is it a totally new story that I haven't heard? Is there a twist in there? And I mean, that does get back to to what your expectations as an audience are. And I've heard other criticisms of Rogue One. I haven't been really reading or listening to um, many reviews in part because I wanted to be able to talk about it without spending the whole time refuting other people's reviews in my head, right. <laughs> which wouldn't make for the best podcast. But I know that there have been some criticisms on other grounds about the coherence of the plot and things like that. I think those are issues that are fair enough to bring up, but I think the idea of originality, it's just, it, it misses the genre. Yeah. They just don't understand what the genre is. I mean, the original Star Wars was a very much a pastiche of a mm -hmm. whole bunch of famous films. And really, there weren't that many twists in it. Yes, Darth Vader being revealed as Luke's father was a twist. Yeah. It wasn't actually, if you really understand how stories go, that much of a twist, though, because there had to be some connection between him and Luke. Mm -hmm. You don't write a story like that and have the villain be sort of unconnected to your main hero. So, yes, it was a twist. Other than that, yeah. there really weren't any twists in the story that you couldn't have expected if you sort of understood how adventure movies worked, other than maybe and Leia being revealed as a sister. Mm -hmm. And there, I mean, as far as I know, George Lucas was highly inspired by, by a series of Japanese movies as well. Mm-hmm. And when you look at it, I mean, the, the original original movies, there was very much, I think, for example, the X-Men versus TIE Fighter stuff, that was all based on or inspired by, I think, movies like Battle of Britain mm -hmm. and, you know, those, and those yeah, yeah. World War II movies. Mm -hmm. The Dam Busters. Mm -hmm. And I love in, in Force Awakens and in Rogue One how they've made the, 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 the Starfighter combat a lot more like World War II. Yeah. Like e even the sounds. Like mm -hmm. when when the when the fighter uh, this is taking a very geeky direction, but I love <laughs> oh, we how don't when, do geeky here. When the fighters God. are firing their lasers, it sounds like you know twenty millimeter cannons. It sounds like the heavy cannons you get on on Spitfires and those World War II fighters, mm -hmm. and in the hand to hand combat too, mm -hmm. the way they're using the lightsabers, it looks a lot more like medieval comp, like mm -hmm. not that whatever it was in, in a New Hope, but yeah. it looks like they're throwing around big swords trying to cleave each other in half it, it's just mm -hmm. there's uh, maybe meatiness isn't the right word but there's a, a substance there mm -hmm. there is very very referential but it's they're they're definitely inspired by something specific mm -hmm. but the way they're using it is just incredible i'm loving it and speaking specifically of of world war ii films i wonder if it's inspired in particular by the dirty dozen yeah, which is a World War II film that mm -hmm. features an infiltration, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know some of the team die, and mm -hmm. um, and there and and it's specifically the the, the band of misfits right. trope, right? Which is very much this team in mm -hmm. Rogue One. People thrown together against their will with the sort of if you do Weird, this, you get characters. There's you know yeah, and somebody is people who are doing it a, a little. I mean, this of course echoes the band of misfits in A New Hope. Yes, with. Yeah. For instance, people who are doing it for their own reasons, yeah. not necessarily noble reasons or for mercenary reasons or in order to, you know, Jin is doing it at least at first just to escape prison. And then after that, it's 
for, for her father, not for the rebellion, and everybody's got different motives. Mm-hmm. So, what did the two of you expect when you when you, when you went into the movie? I didn't expect a lot because I I went in pretty unspoiled. I hadn't. Yeah, I I don't even like watching the trailers that are put out officially for movies because I feel like they kind of cherry pick all the best best bits and then I don't get to experience them fresh. I had watched right. their teaser trailers, yeah, I think, yeah. because they don't give you very much in those. And it's funny how much in for Rogue One, a lot of the stuff that was in the trailers mm-hmm. was not actually in the final film. And that was that was very interesting. Yeah, it, it shows that perhaps there was quite a lot of change in what they decided to do, do from the, the beginning mm-hmm. to the end of the process. And I think there some of the criticisms that are out there about there being a lot of different characters in there and a lot of different worlds, and sometimes the storyline is hard to follow. I think those things are not unreasonable criticisms. It, it didn't bother me, but I can see mm-hmm. how it could, you know. I might have, for instance, liked uh, a bit more time spent with those other characters. They would have mm-hmm. fleshed yeah. them out a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was a lot of very quick movement from person to person. From You got a motivation sketched really br- briefly and then you moved on and there wasn't a lot and there were interesting setups that didn't like the whole smuggler not smugglers but rebels cave yeah and all the people in there it was this, it was an interesting setup that whole group was an interesting setup and then they're all gone <laughs> yeah, one gets the feeling that was cut back it feels like a very elaborate set yeah. and a very elaborate world building moment to have spent as little time there as we did just to have it as cannon fodder yeah even more than the, the fancy set, I think it's just setting up that much exposition and mm-hmm. storyline to then to end it dump all. Yeah. it so quickly. Yeah. I mean, Sol Guerrero is in, he is in Rebels. Uh, he He's appeared Rebels. tonight. Yep. I think this is not a uh, coincidental timing that they came back from their mid-season break with a two-parter that centered around him. For those of you not watching Rebels, it's really good. You should watch Rebels. <laughs> if you like Star Wars, you should also watch the Clone Wars series. Yeah, it's very where, good. Where uh, Saw Gerrera originally appeared. Yeah. I have not watched all of the Clone Wars TV series. Our kids have, but I've watched some of it, and it's the it's parts I've watched cool. are quite good. And as I was seeing a YouTuber discuss when our younger was watching a YouTube video on it, it really allows you to like Anakin in a way that the prequels do not allow you to do. <laughs> you can actually he's just so unlikable in the prequels, but in the, in the Clone Wars, he's, he's really hero. quite he's... genuinely like a, a complex and likable and sympathetic character, which is quite something to do when you start with that series. Anyway, sorry, that's a digression. Okay. One thing I wanted to do is, I think we've probably all kind of tipped our hand on this, but maybe just, I don't want to do a full review of it as a movie, but I think we should perhaps all just say whether we liked it or not. I was sobbing at the end mm-hmm. because the emotional throughput uh, exceeded the bandwidth of my whatever, and <laughs> I was I was crying. After so many years of bad Star Wars movies, mm-hmm. to see Rogue One was just such a good Star Wars movie. Mm-hmm. And it's not just that it was a good movie. It was a good Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. It was really excellent storytelling in the universe. And it was cathartic for me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I I too really liked it. And one of the things I liked about it was that it was in the Star Wars universe, but it was trying to do something different Mm -hmm. rather than just following the mold of, you know, previous movies. Mm Mm-hmm. There we get into the question of creativity and originality. The plot was not original in the sense that we already knew what was going mm-hmm. to happen. Mm-hmm. I think where the originality and creativity it's lay the style of was the, the style and the mm-hmm. genre that mm-hmm. it was aiming at. Yeah, I, mean, I think we should come back to that. I'll say as well, I really liked it. Um, I'm not massively critical of movies in general, so I'm not, I wouldn't be likely to pick it apart. I wanted it to be entertaining and emotional, and it was for me. Uh, I found the ending affecting. I found the link in with Leia at the end affecting. Thank goodness I saw it before Carrie Fisher died. I think I would have been a total mess had I seen that last line after she died. I was was sad enough just thinking about it and am now when I think about it. But, you know, those things hit me emotionally because I care about those characters. One of the things I saw people say was that they didn't care about the main characters in Rogue One. Very, They didn't find that 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 they were ever made to care. I did. I liked them. I thought they were characters I could care about and relate to. So I enjoyed it. I had quibbles with it and all the rest of it. That's not a big deal to me. It doesn't have to be perfect for me to enjoy it. 
I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of the, the uh, a little bit of troubling discourse is where people, you know, the one big flaw I found is, or rather that I agree with once I've read other people's commentaries, is that there weren't enough women characters. I know that it really you glared, know why were there it? any fighter pilots? Yeah, it really stood out to me because. Because they made the main character a woman, which was great. And same with Force Awakens, and they did such a good job. But And Mon Mothma is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And Yeah, no, they've got women in, in power, you know, in powerful positions, and they continue that through from what is in, in fact in the original trilogy. Why are there no women in the world? <laughs> Like in, in the larger world, why are there no female f fighter pilots? Why are there no women in the like ground crews? And the you know the, the sort of grunt soldiers who go with them in, mm -hmm. in to attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could easily have the guys who yeah the guys who volunteer. They only needed like two women, and two I wouldn't women. have even cr criticized them. They didn't have to have a balance. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with the Empire not having any women. Because that's always been a thing. It's that, always been a thing. The and then they can be evil. Be... That can be part of their yeah. evilness. <laughs> that's fine. But my goodness, like, it just seems so tone deaf that I, I don't understand that when they were clearly making a, you know, gesture. Anyway. Yeah, that that did bother I, me. I don't understand that one. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, and a, lot, a few people I've seen have said, well, you know, it doesn't pass the Bechdel test. It should be, you know, it should be discarded. Mm -hmm. You can't, shouldn't mm -hmm. watch it. For me, it's, you know, Star Wars is something I love, and they screw up occasionally, and then you reprimand them for that, mm -hmm. and then you just move on. They can always fix that in, in future movies. The whole point of the original Bechdel test in the cartoon was that she said, I only watch movies that, f that pass the test, though she didn't put it that way, which means basically I've seen Alien and nothing else. The point is that right. nothing passes the Bechdel test. I'm not saying we shouldn't hold it to the standard of doing so. But also that if you don't watch the movie because it doesn't pass the Bechdel test, then you are just You'll never see not anything. watching anything. Mm -hmm. it, it's hardly alone. I mean, it had a main character not motivated by a love story. A main female character not motivated by a love story. This in Force Awakens. Just that alone. Yeah. She's not. I mean, she's, yes, she's motivated by family connections. But so is everybody in the Star Wars world, right? Mm -hmm. That's an ongoing mm -hmm. thing. Luke is. Leia is. They're connected by family as well as other reasons so that's okay that's not a female centric thing in the star wars world you know they didn't give her a love story even with the holding hands at the end they didn't kiss they didn't yeah. i i wish they hadn't held hands at the end i was okay with holding I... hands because they're about to, you're die. About to die and this is another yeah, human true. friend i mean yeah, can't yeah you hold that, that's a fair point yeah but i i know what you mean i i i, I was worried they were going to give us a kissing on the beach mm -hmm. scene and they didn't and thank god for that <laughs> Um, oh, be too South Pacific. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing. One of the things that really stood out for me when I started thinking about the movie, and I think I'd like to talk about this a bit because it ties it back to our Force Awakens discussion, mm. is about heroism and the hero. And this ties into having the main character and what her motivations are. When we talked about Force Awakens, we talked about epic right? Mm. And saga. Yeah. Those were the two genres we talked about. And one of the reasons was because of the very, very specific and explicit connections between the original trilogy and uh, the heroic quest as uh, envisioned by Joseph Campbell and then epic and Norse saga. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. So when we look at Rogue One, Mark, you talked about Norse saga well, is there Norse saga involved here? Like, is that a gen generic reference point we can make? I mean, they they refer to the you know the three trilogies mm -hmm. as being the saga films, and that right. does work because it it is sort of like a family saga. Mm -hmm. It takes place over several generations. Yeah. But what about Rogue One? So there's there is a I suppose uh, an an analogy to be made. Mm -hmm. There is a genre called the Thouter. Mm -hmm. which is basically the Old Norse equivalent of a short story. So... Oh, right. Yes, I remember those A, a now. sort of standalone, yeah. uh, episodic, you know, short, self-contained story. And in mm -hmm. a sense, you could argue that these one-off films that they're doing mm -hmm. are analogous to that, mm -hmm. that there are these short, episodic, uh, one-off, standalone. Though, in a, in a lot of ways, this one, anyways, wasn't that standalone. I mean, mm -hmm. it does tie in so so strongly to mm -hmm. A New Hope. But it is what makes it standalone 
in that sense is that its characters, its main characters, are, are not, They're not connected the, yeah. or yeah. family members or yeah. avenging the deaths of yeah. somebody in another movie or something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's a it's a sort of standalone episode in that sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've, we could think of it as as a, a strand, a, 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 mm-hmm. a thouter. That sort of works. Coming back to your point about heroism, mm-hmm. I mean, there is the Germanic idea of the heroism of a losing battle, dying, everyone dying in the end. Right. Okay. So hold on to that thought because that's something I wanted to bring up. So because if I then say, okay, that's saga, what about epic? I will say Roman and Greek epic, this basically isn't. No. And I like I think it's it's very it's not antithetical to it, but it just it doesn't follow the tropes of epic. It doesn't match up to what epic is. Yeah. Except in largely that epic is about fighting and mm-hmm. heroes. I mean, yes, it's about that. So I would say that it it doesn't do what Force Awakens did. Mm-hmm. It's not Virgil to to the original series, Homer, certainly. And it also does not give us the heroic journey. No, it's it doesn't have that Joseph Campbell no, influence. It does not have a quest narrative to it. I mean, it has elements of that because it's just from the way the storytelling works. But a very obvious thing is the hero doesn't win. Yeah. I mean, the hero wins, but the hero doesn't come back, right? The heroic quest, the hero comes back. And that's not true necessarily in all myth, but certainly if you look at Greek myth, the idea of the doomed hero, the idea of the hero whose nobility or valor comes from the losing cause, Mm -hmm. it doesn't really exist in Greek myth. The closest you can maybe... Whoever is sitting there right now with the counterpoint to this and talking back to the podcast, please tweet at me or email me to tell me what I'm forgetting. But the closest I could think of is Hector in the Iliad, who, of course, dies. So he's a hero, but he does. But his heroism doesn't lie in his death. Like, at the end, he's running away. Yeah, it, it lies in the fight. Well, and it lies in the fighting that he did up to that point. The way he. And I've only ever seen Troy. (laughs) <laughs> so it's, that's the image I have in my head. Okay. Well, let me say that in the Iliad, um, he's a great hero because he has defended Troy for so long and he has been their, their bulwark. That's not how that word's pronounced. Their is bulwark. It? Bulwark. He has been their bulwark against the Greeks. But in the end, when he fights against Achilles, he runs away from him three times around the wall, asking them to open the gates and let him in. That, that's not where his his heroism is, because at that point, Achilles is clearly the greater hero and kills him. Now, it's a more complex story of the Iliad, but as a myth, the heroism of Hector does not lie in the fact that he's killed. That's not what makes him a hero. That's what makes his end tragic, but it's not what makes him a hero. And other than that, there really aren't any heroes who die in a losing, uh, die in a winning cause, in a sense. Like, because that's what Rogue One does. We, we have is heroes who lose the battle to win the war. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of some of the, the British war movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one about ex, uh, little miniature submarines attacking uh, a battleship in Norway. Mm-hmm. And most of them die, mm-hmm. except... And I, I think there, there is a genre of these mm-hmm. British war movies where most of the... You know, you've got the plucky heroes. Yeah. You know, there's the Canadian reservists and all the, all <laughs> the other people who are screw-ups. Yeah. And they get shifted off to some unit in Scotland and they train for a suicide mission and then they die bravely. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree entirely. I mean, I, I, I certainly think this is a type of heroism that is really uh, an important one in our, in our culture. Um, but where it doesn't come from... I guess is my point, is it doesn't come yes. from Greek myth in the way that the heroism and the heroic quest of Luke and then echoed so yeah. far anyway by Rey in um, Force Awakens, that does match with that kind of heroism, but it's not there in the Greek. Now, there is some of that in Roman legend. There's a bit more of that because in Roman legend, which is not myth, and is not really, I don't think Roman legend is really ever what, what Lucas was drawing on in the first trilogy, not really. But in Roman legend, you have, you know, um, Horatius at the bridge who stands and, and holds off the entire army while the rest of his of the Romans um, flee. Or Scaevola, who's uh, captured by the enemy and won't tell them anything and thrusts his right hand into the flames to show him and, has, and burns it off to show that he is 
so manly that he will never give in to their torture and they're so impressed that they send him home and then he's nicknamed Lefty. What about the Spartans who heroically all die in that pass to hold off the Persians? Ah, the Spartans. Now that's fair. That's a, that is, the Spartans are definitely a good example. Thank you for bringing that up because I hadn't thought of that. Now that's not myth. Um, that's actually a thing <laughs> that happened it's actual life. It's actual history. I mean, it's it, it's mythologized in the way that it's told, but it was an actual event. But there, you, I mean, they're doing that because of the idealizing of that kind of heroic bravery. So, yeah, that's they're probably the best example. The other one I was going to make um, that has some connections to it. There was a figure in Roman history called Decius Mus. Uh, he was a consul in 340 BC, so he's in that sort of early semi-legendary period. And he went through the ritual of devotio, which was something where a Roman general or leader would vow himself to the gods and say, if I die, let my side win. Let the Romans win. And so he did this, and then he ran out in front of the troops as they attacked and made sure that he got himself killed in the fighting, thereby ensuring that the Romans would win. So that... Um, that is in a, I mean, it's not the same narrative mechanism as is going on in Rogue One, but it's that celebration of the person who is willing to sacrifice themselves so that their side wins. Mm-hmm. And what I was thinking about that is, and I think the Spartan example that you brought up there, Sam, is right, is that it's not a mythic narrative pattern. It's a military narrative pattern. Mm-hmm. For the Romans and the Spartans, it's a type of warrior ideal when you're fighting for a larger community. Right. Because it doesn't make it. It's yeah. worth dying for because you have a cause right. and a larger community that you're protecting. And in that sense, the Spartans die, but not all of Sparta is wiped out. The Spartans die in order to save the rest of the Spartans and the Romans die so that they save the rest of the Romans. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a larger community for whom the sacrifice is worthwhile. And that's, of course, the basic idea behind all of those British war movies that you brought up. But about the North, the North Germanic ideal is a little different, though. Yes. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, there certainly are examples of heroes dying to protect a community. Mm-hmm. In specifically Anglo-Saxon circles, there's the Battle right. of Malden, yeah. uh, where they fight a losing battle against Viking invaders mm-hmm. and uh, sacrifice themselves, basically. Right. But I was thinking the 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 sort of um, slightly more lone warrior ideal of just right. of just the basic celebration for, of for honor, just and and just the the mere fact of dying in battle. I mean, that's part of the Germanic yeah. fight. It doesn't actually matter why you die dying in battle. battle. Just dying in battle is is honorable and and, and heroic. Heroic. It yeah. is almost a definition of a hero. Yeah, and that I think is a different, a slightly different storyline. Yeah, the only way to get to Valhalla is to die in the battlefield. So they don't let you into Valhalla only if you were fighting for a good cause when you died on the battlefield. No, it's just a question of dying. (laughs) (laughs) You you could have fought really poorly, actually, (laughs) just so long as you die there. (laughs) So it really is almost like Stovokor. Yeah. Sorry, the Klingon afterwards. Right. Yeah, no, no, I think that... Very much based on that, yeah. Yeah, that part of the Klingon. I mean, the the Klingons are a mix of Japanese and Norse, really, I think, in terms of how their, their warrior culture is created. So I just wanted to bring that up because we had made those strong connections for The Force Awakens. And I think that this, so what we see, and I think this is part of the difference in tone you were talking about, Mark, mm-hmm. the difference in genre, is this is not a movie with a mythic underlying no. story. It's a mi- movie with a military underlying yeah. story. Does that sound right to you, Sam? I think there there's really two sort of genres or coming together in Rogue One. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where some of the, the trouble lies for, for people. On the one hand, there's... Okay, one thing that re- really struck me is how British this movie was. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, really British. in terms <laughs> Not just in terms of the actors, but there is this sort of... The lone Englishman or, you know, the small group of Englishmen go off and do something incredibly stupid for a dubious cause, and they all die, but they're great heroes because they did... It's, you know, it's like the celebration mm-hmm. of people going down to the South Pole thinking yeah. that Protestant faith would protect them from freezing cold. Yeah, the sort of pig-headedness of the British that's somehow noble in itself. Strident Protestant faith. And <laughs> that was part of it. Uh, and the other part of it was, it was you, you've got that coming into the Second World War with you know, the, all the Battle of Britain stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's totally mm-hmm. Battle of Britain inspired. 
But mm-hmm. it, Rogue One was also a heist flick. Yes. yes. Uh, and Norm Wilner, who is a, a film critic in uh, Now Magazine, he was talking about this. And they tried to sell Rogue One as a war, as a Star Wars war movie. Mm-hmm. It is. Absolutely is. But it's also, you know, the Star Wars uh, Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. 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 Because I talked to him a bit about this, and he said, you know, you've usually got three acts. Mm-hmm. And I think the first act is you introduce all the people. Mm-hmm. The second, you know, the bringing together of the team. The second act is the training and the plotting and the whatever. Mm-hmm. And then the third act is the actual heist. Yeah, yeah. And you, they, they've tried to bring that into Rogue One. And I think that that produced the kind of narrative disconnect for some people mm-hmm. who went in expecting a straight-up war mm-hmm. movie. Right. And what they got was a war movie slash heist movie. And that's a little bit what you're talking about, Mark. Sorry, with the, with the Dirty Dozen idea, with that sort of band of... Band of misfits, yeah. yeah. You know, Seven Samurai. Yeah. The seven or Samurai. Magnif- Magnificent Seven or whatever version yeah. people want to watch. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think that there's um, a sort of a mashup element or something, and that it could be felt as incoherence by an audience. And, and I think some people did feel it as incoherence as, as not sure, not being sure one scene feels like a, a war movie scene. The next scene feels like, I, I'm not saying that's exactly how I read it. I didn't have that reaction, but I don't think it's a completely ridiculous reaction to have. And I can understand how people could feel that because they, that they might be feeling like they're flipping between genres and they're not sure what they want to be. I, and I think they were flipping mm-hmm. between the genres. Yeah. They weren't so much integrated as they really were flipping Yeah, and that probably them. is 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 a, a a valid criticism of it that they didn't weren't able to make them sort of mesh as well as you would have liked. If you're going to mix genres, which I have no problem with, they maybe could have mixed them better. Um, and I think for people also going in expecting, therefore, a, a mythic. Yeah. One of the things about a mythic storyline is it's really simple. Mm-hmm. Like a mythic storyline. Yeah doesn't have a lot of plot development no myths don't have plot developments they have occasionally side myths no. or you know side quests or something but essentially they have really simple plot developments and that's certainly true of the original series and barring a few little baroque touches it's pretty true of force awakens so far too it's really just one journey with a couple of stops along the way and only a few main characters and their basic relationships to one another and their motivations so if that's your model for what you want out of a star wars movie and understandably because that's how it's been mm-hmm. and i mean that was part of what people didn't like about the prequels i mean that's a lot of things people didn't like about the prequels but one of the things is that they weren't really mythic storylines either or no. there was a mythic storyline but there was a lot of a lot of political a lot of other kinds of stuff on top no one wants to see a movie about trade negotiations <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe you could have, but it was hard to have that. Okay, I want to see a movie about crazy. <laughs> but it was hard to meld that with a quest narrative yeah. and with a mythic storyline and with the, the, the idea of the sort of rise and fall of the hero. Um, and that was that was a, a major problem. So I, but I like the fact that this wasn't mythic in that I think it opens up a, a whole new range of ways for them to tell stories. What you were talking about, Sam, of... of in the same way that the extended universe gave them mm-hmm. other stories to tell. Absolutely. If you're only doing Joseph Campbell over and over again. Yeah, there's only so many times they can go to that well. Well, and you can, yeah, because the point about that is it's really only one plot. Yeah. And you can change the names. I'm okay with that with The Force Awakens and the, the you know, 789. Absolutely. I'm okay with seeing this repeated, but not ad nauseum. <laughs> not yeah. every single set of stories. So... Uh, so I think they need to move it out of that mm-hmm. that genre. I can't help but think about Star Trek mm-hmm. because I mean the one thing about Star Trek is all the best movies come from a cast that's already been together for a TV show. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you know who the characters are, you know what the relations are. There is an established something mm-hmm. there, and then in a movie you could just, you just get to tell a really awesome story. Yeah. A story that usually would be a three or four parter, but you put it into one thing and it's better. Yeah. I think in Star Wars. Because it's only ever been movies. Well, okay, that's not true. No, but but the, because the, the, but they're they've never really been able to work with the expectation that you've seen anything other than the movies. That's the important yeah, thing it, for their audience. You know that that Rebels and the Clone Wars have been treated as, as this kind of side side thing, kind of not Star Wars yeah. and well, they consider kids shows. And so they they can't make the movies with the assumption that their audience has watched all of those shows. 
And so they're still limited by the same constraints as if those shows didn't exist, essentially. There, there is so much potential for really good st- storytelling in Star mm-hmm. Wars. It doesn't have to be the, the movies that we've already seen. Mm-hmm. There, there was a, um, a, t- a computer game from 1994 or 5 called TIE Fighter. Mm. And it was my favorite computer game ever. And what you do is you were an Imperial pilot flying around blowing up the rebels. And it was great. And it was because it was a, there was a really good they did some really good storytelling there because they didn't have to build everything out already. They had this whole world. Yeah. Yeah. They had an entire world and they could just tell a very different story. Mm-hmm. I'm really hoping they do some of that in these movies. And if that, if that means bringing in different genres, bringing different perspectives, more power to mm-hmm. them. And that some people will, will complain that they're doing something different. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good potential mm-hmm. there. No, I, I I don't want to say that if you disliked Rogue yeah. One, it's just because you took the wrong attitude to it. Oh, that's because true. I do think I I do think that if I sat down with my okay, I'm going to be a dispassionate critic hat on. I I don't really have that hat actually. I don't own a dispassionate critic hat, but I I think there were some some problems with it. They didn't bother me. They were not big enough problems to dis- disrupt me, but. I come in with a very strong emotional investment in the story and I liked it. I don't think it was a failure as an experiment. Let's put it that way. I don't think it said, oh no, don't do this anymore. I really hope it's not read that way. And I don't think so. I mean, it's been successful. I don't yeah. think there's any reason that the studio won't be happy to go on with this kind of an approach because even if they didn't do the mechanics of it perfectly, of, as you say, blending genres and stuff, I think it's really the right step for these side movies to be. Oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. It reminds me of Terry. You've both read Terry Pratchett. I have. Yes, Mark I've read knows one, about one it. Book. <laughs> and here's, here's me and my mom quote from it yeah. on a regular basis. He knows enough about it. <laughs> the thing that I love about Discworld is that there isn't a main sequence. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could start with Color of Magic if you were insane, but... <laughs> There, you know, there's the, the death books and the watch and the witches. Yeah, they they and... fit into a general timeline, at least once he sort of gets going. Yeah. And there's a cast of characters that somewhat overlap. And there's a geography that overlaps. And that's the world building. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of different threads you can follow and you can weave in and out of them. You don't need to follow only one. And each of them has a very different feel. You can be a great, you know, you can be a big Discworld fan and not like all the books. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I think that's that's somewhere we have to get with Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Well, if they're going to keep making these number of movies, then I think yes. you're inevitably going to get that way. When there were only three movies, you liked them or didn't because they fit together. But we're going to have nine of the main sequence fairly soon. We're going to have a movie a year. To ask everybody to love all of them equally would be craziness, I think. Would be craziness. And so we're not used to Star Wars doing that because so far... It's, that's where we're going. It's been so. one long story. It's been one maybe. long story. And even with the prequels being kind of stepped outside in times of genre, they still locked into that story. There was still... You could kind of ignore bits of it and just call it one long arc. But but that's what they're going for now. And, and I think that that will mean inevitably that people will like some of them more than others because I don't like every genre that's out there. I anticipate not liking some as much as I like others. And I don't think that means that they're bad movies or that they shouldn't make them. But they won't necessarily have the same kind of universal grab. Not that Star Wars was ever universally loved, but you know what I mean. Even yeah, among Star Wars fans, not everyone's going to like every one of them. And that's okay. The other one thing I wanted to bring up was about Rogue One as a war movie, which mm-hmm. you've touched on multiple times now. But I really did feel that it is a, that, it, that it is a war movie in a way that the other movies were not. And I think we've touched on why that's true. But I think one of the important things is the themes of the movie are very different what would what would you say were the overarching themes, not plot, but themes of Rogue One? War sucks. Yeah, mm. yeah, I I agree. That's pretty. I mean that that's a lot of the start for me. It's just mm-hmm. war is terrible and everybody's exhausted. Everybody's exhausted and everybody requires people to make moral. Everybody's compromised. Compromised. Everybody's yeah. compromised in war. That nobody is nobody is a hero in mm-hmm. war. Mm-hmm. 
I, I saw some criticisms that said that after Rogue One, the Rebels didn't have moral purity hmm. anymore. And that for that made them less of the good guys. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, for me, it's they're complex mm-hmm. and they are not a monolith. Mm-hmm. Well, and that, I think, gets back to the myth versus war movie. I mean, in mm-hmm. myth, there are good guys and bad guys, or at least that's how we think of myth. I mean, that's not true of the ancient world mm-hmm. stories. But, you know... In a mythical narrative, narratives are straightforward, and there are heroes and antagonists, even if we don't call them heroes and villains. There are, there's the good guys, and then there's the guys who impede them. Mm-hmm. But that's not how war movies work. No, because it's more about individual... Mm-hmm. And, and things Feelings like and... the connections and relationships formed by fighting together, the comradeship... In spite of, very often it's in spite of knowing that you're maybe not fighting for the, in spite of maybe not knowing who you're fighting for or why, uh, the hell of war, the idea that you nonetheless form these attachments and that in the end, the cause for which you fight is not the cause, but is for the protection of your comrades. It's, some people talked about in means and ends, Mm -hmm. and I, I've had a, I've been trying to get away from that recently. I, I've been watching shows like Justified, where it's you know there are cops and there are villains, mm-hmm. uh, but it's you know somebody does something that they have to do, and then the cops have to do their job and the villains have to do their job. But it's not in the, you don't have the you know the mustache twirling evil guy mm-hmm. right. being evil just for the sake of it. It's just he's got a thing he has to do, and the cops have to try to arrest him for it. Mm-hmm. They don't take moral out of it, but they set moral to the side as not the point. Mm-hmm. And I love that they brought that into Star Wars, mm-hmm. where there's. But at, at the same time, I think there is there is still a moral. There is um, yes. there. It gets it gets cliched to say, oh, the story, the theme is that the ends do or don't justify the means. One of the things I think is good about the movie is it doesn't actually answer that question. No, yeah. It it raises, it raises the, question, the question. Do the ends justify the means? It doesn't answer it. That's true. Because it doesn't reward somebody for valiantly refusing to give in to, you know, to t- tarnishing their hands because nobody actually valiantly refuses to get it, give in. And even when Cassian, for instance, does kind of refuse to do the dirty deed he's been sent to do, yeah. makes a bit of a moral stand, but in the end dies. So in movie language, he isn't rewarded for it. I don't mean that he's punished for it, but, you know, it, you, movie language, uh, people are rewarded for virtue by surviving mm-hmm. <laughs> in a certain kind of, of movie, you know, like in the horror movies or in the adventure movies, right? The good guys survive and the bad guys don't. Or sometimes the good guys heroically sacrifice themselves, but often it's because they're redeeming themselves for something they've all done that's awful. Mm-hmm. So if if he dies to redeem himself, and I'm not saying that's what the movie's doing, but if he does, then it's proving that what he did was bad. But I think that it doesn't, because everybody dies, (laughs) it doesn't make that choice, right? Mm -hmm. If one or two of them survived, then you'd say, okay, well, did they make, did they choose ends over means or means over ends? And now the movie has made that moral sort of clear to us, but they all die. It made the point moot. Yeah, it made the point that, in fact, it doesn't matter what you do because it's war and people die in war, fairly or unfairly. They just do. Like the force sensitive guy. Right. Who quite clearly never did a single thing that we could call unmoral. Like, yeah. I mean, he was, if there was virtue, he was virtuous the whole way through. He did everything he should do. He was kind. He was protective. He was noble. And he dies. And his friend, who was unwilling but then was noble, he dies. Like it, the mo- movie doesn't make that moral judgment because it just kills everybody. Mm-hmm. And I like that. I mean, I, I didn't enjoy them all dying when I was sobbing in the theater, but I, I like that it makes that choice. I just, I, I like, I keep, I keep on saying that. Well, Mary Beard says that the job of the historian is to make everything more complex, mm-hmm. and Rogue One certainly made Star Wars more complex. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Not in the universe, but in terms of the narrative and the morals and the everything else going on. Yeah. The mythology of the original series, which was made more complex to a certain extent by the prequels, um, for, you know, they were poorly done, but the ideas behind them did at least make the 
I mythology more complex. But nonetheless, it really boiled down to some very straightforward, you know, virtue on one side, villainy on the other side, types of moral purity on one side, types of self-interest on the other side. And a whole group of people who don't understand the word balance. Yes. <laughs> who assume that balance means only one side wins. But then this movie is, it participates in that to a certain extent by having, you know, the mythology is still there. The force is still there. But really, it was not a movie about the force. That was just a superpower that he had. Mm-hmm. It was not the point of it. Right? It wasn't the point. The point was not about proving how you needed to live your life. And so it was much more, not more interesting. I like the other ones too. I don't want to make it sound like I didn't, I don't think the mythological narrative is good. I like it too. But it's, it is more complex, like you said. I feel where in, in the prequels, what they tried to do was, I mean, you when you create a world, you have two really two options. You either define everything all at mm-hmm. once or you leave big gaps open and then try to define it later. I think what they did in the prequels is they took the force and then tried to provide all, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Tom Clancy-esque details, letting you know exactly how it works. Where what they've done in in Rogue One mm-hmm. is actually said, well, here's adding different ways of how it could work, because they brought apparently they brought back references yeah. like language the around the, the force. That was in the original drafts of A New Hope. And even the, the praying of, I'm one with the force, the force, I'm with the force. Yes, what is and it that? that was... I'm one with the force, the force is with me. Yeah. His 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 mantra sort of praying. I mean, that we don't see that as, as a form of prayer. No. Uh, we never see that in the original trilogy. And yet it does make total sense mm-hmm. uh, with the sort of mythology that's developed there. So I could imagine that being part of it too. And it, it brings in whole kinds of sort of medieval-esque things mm-hmm. which are echo- echoed other places but I, I i love that they're bringing in m- more kind of historical references into the movie and just generally making it more fuzzy yeah because we don't really have to know how everything works to the finest detail mm-hmm. i think the thing that we, you've you've referred to a couple of times and that i do like about the movie and one way in which it is similar to classical literature for me is in its referential nature not only as you were just saying to various periods of history and things like that but it's self-referential it's intra-textual references and some of that is i mean you can talk about it as fan service right so some of it is things like the the moss Eisley guys showing up at uh jetta yeah dr evazan those kinds of things but i think also some of the ways they kind of are writing in and around the genre, you can call it fan fiction-esque, but you can also, again, I go back to how all of Roman poetry and all of Roman literature worked, but especially poetry, the ways you're referencing established canon, you're working in references to your own work, to other people's work, uh, and that that is part of how you enrich and how you, how you enrich your own work and make it more interesting, both to build the world larger, but also genuinely because it is a pleasure for somebody who is watching it who knows the other things to see it like for it it's it's its own end to some degree of saying can you spot all of that i mean we think of it now as being fan servicing or fan wanking if you want to be rude about it easter eggs i think it's easter eggs yeah yeah but in fact it's not like this is a new idea the idea of putting stuff in that only the really clued in reader will get the one who shares your literary background, who has your canon, who has your taste in poetry. The idea of putting those kinds of little references in goes back at very least to the Romans. Mm. Now this is a movie. It's not literature, but in the same way, it's a textual culture. It's a culture that has a fixed text that you can revisit over and over again and see till you've memorized it well enough that when you see something that recalls it, you can tell it's an illusion if the, even just the briefest of references. Those things, the, there's a pleasure in that for somebody who, who knows the world. And I think that that is something that is, in fact, very classical about these, mm. these movies. That doesn't remove originality or creativity from them. The fact that they reference themselves. You can't get away from no. it. I mean, especially with a movie that apparently you know, is supposed to take, take place right before the beginning of the saga. You have to 
if it was completely original, didn't have any references at all, it, there'd be – it wouldn't fit into the narrative. Mm-hmm. When you're writing to an established universe, you, I mean you have to reference the universe just because you've mm-hmm. got to. And also because why else bother writing to that established universe? <laughs> Otherwise, just tell another story, story also yeah. set in space. <laughs> you know, like – One of my favorite examples of this is in Star Trek, I think, in Trek, the original series, in the pilot episode, someone references Admiral Archer's Beagle. Oh, yeah. And then they put that in Enterprise. And then in Star Trek Enterprise, they actually had Captain Archer's Beagle. And I thought that was, you know, those kinds of little references where it's not even how clever are we, but it's just, it's it's almost for the writer's Mm -hmm. amusement. But also it makes it a real world because you're not discarding details. The details matter. They're real things. Yeah. So I, I think the intratextuality, and that's where like Pratchett does that all the time. I mean, he does time. it self-consciously and as partly as a joke, but also because that, that just enriches and makes more entertaining those stories that you get a reference and it will be picked up. It might be four books later in terms of his writing chronology, but it'll get picked up somewhere else and it won't be contradicted. And, and those things matter to someone who loves those books. And even when there are contradictions, you could just use the time monks to uh, add <laughs> the way. Well, that's what fantasy gets to do. Fantasy gets to rewrite the canon and the uh, rules every time. Star Wars is absolutely fantasy. Mm-hmm. Because, it is. because that myth a lot, you know, that magic, the force stuff, it is mm-hmm. fantasy all the way. But I will say that Rogue One is the least fantastic of the movies so far. I completely agree. Absolutely. The prequels are pretty unfantastic in some ways. They don't really. I mean, they still have fantasy in them, but they're but they, less they've fantastic. They've tried to make Star Wars into sci fi. Mm-hmm. It's what they've tried to do. But Rogue One is a lot closer to sci fi than it is to fantasy. It's sci fi with dose of fantasy. Because... I, I, I'm not sure even, even it really is sci fi. To, it, it, to me, it really yeah. is just war movie. It's and, a war you know, movie. Yeah, it's yeah in that Star... happens to be set in space. You're right. No, it, that's. I think you're right. That's fair. It doesn't really fit the sci fi tropes. No, no. In particular. No, that's fair. I did think that they did have some nice echoes of some of the original characters yeah. in moments, as well as, of course, featuring some of the original characters. What did you think of the, the 3D or the, the CGI versions of the Grand Moff Tarkin and of the princess? Grand Moff Tarkin was great. I, I thought he was good. I, I th- it, it didn't quite like... It didn't quite ring true? It didn't quite ring true. And I didn't even really he looked cre- know that... Yeah, he looked kind of creepy to me. Um, I didn't even really know that they were doing it, so I didn't have I, I wasn't even keyed to it. I kind of vaguely knew that something in it was gonna be mm. done, but I hadn't I found him a little Uncanny you know, Valley. Uncanny Valley, yeah. I, I found him more convincing. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you were really sort of looking, you could you could see this is What did you think, Sam? I, I thought it, it almost burst the disbelief a little bit. Just mm-hmm. and that was just the visual. There was something mm-hmm. – I don't know whether he was just slightly too thin or something, but there was something that just wasn't quite right mm-hmm. about the look of him. And then because of that, I started looking, thinking about what didn't quite sound quite right. Mm. I wish they hadn't used him as much. Mm. I mean they, I, I don't mind that they put him in. I, I can see why they needed to use him for the continuity. Mm-hmm. He kind of needs to be involved be, to make the it make sense. Yeah. Mm. But – they didn't really need to have him, you know, you could have written a lot of those scenes with him out or written somebody else in. You didn't need to make the the conflict between him and the Death Star creator guy right. a central part. Mm-hmm. Like, that wasn't necessary to the larger story. Uh, or you could have done it a different way. Like, if I, I don't think it was well enough done that they should have re- leaned on it as much as they did. I agree. I think if he'd been in a couple of scenes, it wouldn't have really stood out. Now, Leia, see there, they didn't lean on, right? It was Mm. only a tiny bit. And I... I thought that was great. I thought it was perfect. I didn't see anything. I I thought that was really good. I found her much more cartoony looking. Really? I didn't... To me, I really was thrown by it. I thought, how did they do... Like, I I was thrown by how real it was. I thought, was this just a clip? But it couldn't be a clip because the quality is too good. Like, I, I think it passed just because how short it was. Yeah, I think that was a yeah. big part of well, it. I think it was a good idea that it was short. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wish that the other one had been short as well. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think 
I, I don't think it's at a state where it should be relied on that heavily. I almost thought they were going to with her. I thought they were just going to show only her back. Right. You know, and they could, I think they, they, could, have they could have just done yeah. that. They could have had her reaching it and could have had the voiceover yeah. and, and her receiving the thing. And But it would have been a little bit sort of obvious if they'd done that too. So The other criticism I've read is, you know, at the end of Rogue One, Vader is a sword swinging, badass, awesome guy. He, he's just, you know, he rips through the rebel fleet. Yeah. But at the beginning of, of New Hope, he is, you know, he, he lets the Stormies go first. You know, and then he comes in and gets until he's later. So there, people have been talking about that disconnect, about going from you know Vader the sword swinging guy and then Vader the force choking guy afterwards. I think that's probably true, but I don't really like. I don't think I would have preferred it had Vader been less active in this movie. I think it was great. Like you can't yeah. fix what it is in New Hope. Yeah, you that's, can't that's change the thing. that. I mean, yes, you would have liked to see them you know, in their saber battle, be a little yeah. more animated. I mean, but New Hope... It is what it is. If if we all had our druthers, New Hope's fight scenes would have been way better. True. I mean, that is one of the big lacks of, mm-hmm. you know, New Hope's fight scenes suck. Especially when compared to what is able to, to be done later. But that's just a feature of the conditions of making the movie and the conditions of, you know, all sorts of things. They can't change that. And I don't think pulling back in Rogue One to make it match up would have improved Rogue One. That's true. And it wouldn't really affect, and it's not going to affect, maybe I'm just better at suspending my disbelief. I like it. The point that my friend Dave makes is that in Rogue One, you know, the Death Star plans are going to get away. So you're going to go all out, do everything you get, you can to get those, those plans back. But at the beginning of New Hope, mm-hmm. he thinks he's got them. Yeah, he doesn't need mm-hmm. to make exactly. a big show. He's not putting out all of his effort. Yeah, I know. I think you can headcanon it away without too much difficulty. But really, at, at bottom, I, I I don't think you compromise on Rogue One in order to make it match up with what is suboptimal in A New Hope. Like I just don't think, as a filmmaker, that makes sense. Frankly, in the same way that the space battles in Rogue One so good light years if you'll excuse it the term parsecs ahead (laughs) parsecs ahead ahead of the space battles in a new hope but i don't think anybody wanted them to like make them crappier in rogue one so that they matched up with the quality of the dogfights in new hope i mean that just doesn't make sense and i i I don't think what for me i mean at least it's not the dogfights are probably the least important Mm -hmm. part to me about Mm -hmm. new hope oh yeah no absolutely that always gets me when Luke's, Luke rocks forward and back in his fighter. And I don't know why they do that <laughs> in A New Hope. It's just he's he, theoretically flying in a semi-straight line, but he's rocking back and forth. And that just – that gets me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's – um, let's just say that I think Lucas was still learning a lot of stuff in that movie. He was creating and inventing a whole new way of making movies. It, not all of it worked <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> that is a fair point all right well anything that anybody desperately wanted to say that i did not let you say i think i'm good yeah i'm good all right well thank you so much for joining us sam this was really fun yeah well thank you for having me hopefully we can do this again in the future yeah for sure it's nice to have just uh somebody else to bounce some of these ideas (laughs) off of (laughs) Instead of just each other, um, we did spend a lot of time not talking about the movie together so that we would be fresh in discussing it. Um, but that can only go on so long. I'm just glad we had it. It was a really good chance to really talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. And I know that I will be watching it again and, and again, again and again. And again. <laughs> as soon as it comes out on Netflix, I'm watching it again. Well, it'll have to go into our Star Wars be watching that we do with the kids. Yeah. If nothing else, I think that both of the movies that Disney has made have exceeded my initial expectations for what Disney would do with the franchise. Oh, far and away. Yeah. When I first heard that Disney was taking it over, I was not impressed. Yeah. And I have been very pleased with what they've done. And if they keep doing it at this level, up or down a bit, I'm going to be very happy. Two for two so far. Yeah. 
Absolutely. They, they've they certainly done a better job than J.J. Abrams did with the new Star Trek movies. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. And they've also done a better job than George Lucas did with the prequels. Prequels, yeah. I so, agree. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fair play to them. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. And remind us again, Sam, where people can find you if they'd like to talk to you. I'm on Twitter at Canadian underscore errant. And I'm at www.britishnavalhistory.com. All right. And of course you, all right. Well, we will talk to you on Twitter. I'll talk to you guys later. Yep. And thanks again for joining us. Bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.